Welcome to this evening's special event, Open to the Public, Rethinking Security and Access in Public Spaces. My name is Roxanne Blackwell, and I, along with my colleague, Kurt Millay, are currently the Acting Executive Vice Presidents and CEO of the American Society of Landscape Architects. We are affectionately known as ASLA, and ASLA is the professional organization that serves about 15,000 landscape architects in 49 chapters around the country. Landscape architects are licensed, licensed in all 50 states, and I can proudly say, and now in the District of Columbia. <laughs> so I hear a lot of applause in the room, so it sounds like many of you are familiar with landscape architecture, but for those of you who are wondering, you know, help me to understand landscape architecture and security design. I know that landscape architects and some of their iconic projects are most known to you, like Central Park in New York, the Capitol Grounds here, the National Mall, the High Line, uh, Millennial Park in Chicago. But landscape architects plan and design all the spaces outside of the buildings. So your community master plans, your multimodal transportation networks, your national and community parks, your stormwater management projects, commercial development, all of that is created by landscape architects. And at the core of landscape architects' education and training, and what they are licensed to do, is protect the health, safety, and welfare of the public. So it is only fitting that landscape architects be a part of this conversation. It's only fitting that we be an integral part of the panel this evening. But I have to be honest with you. I have mixed feelings about being here this evening. On the one hand, I am very honored to be here with Gary Hildebrand and his, to hear about some of his preeminent projects and to see him represent the profession. I am excited to partner with NCPC, the preeminent planning organization for the nation's capital. But I'm also saddened. I'm saddened that words like accessibility Parks, shopping centers, streetscapes, equity, and beauty will be in the same conversation with words like hate, fear, intolerance, guns, bigotry, and displacement. The tragic events in Charlottesville, El Paso, and Dayton are just a few of the recent reminders that demonstrate the need for these conversations. So sadly, these are conversations that we must have. But more importantly, there is a need for solutions. So I have another emotion that I'm going to share with you, and that's confidence. I'm confident that tonight's panel is going to shed some light on possible design solution to some of these issues. I'm confident that the panel is gonna walk us through how to design spaces to make them secure without making them inhospitable fortresses. How to ensure that safety and security for one community does not disadvantage another. And finally, I'm confident that we all are going to enjoy a robust discussion about how to live safely, yet still feel free. And so with that, I wanna thank all of you for being here this evening, for participating in this much needed conversation. I wanna thank NCPC and Marcella Costa for partnering with ASLA. And we look forward to partnering you, with you on future events. And I'll turn it over to Tom Gallis. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you, Roxanne. Um, and thanks to the American Society of Landscape Architects for uh, jointly sponsoring tonight's event. And thank you all for coming. 
On behalf of the National Capital Planning Commission, I'd like to also extend my welcome to all of you attending this program, focusing on protecting people in public places, while also encouraging open access to those same spaces. This confidence that Roxanne talked about is something that I think we all want to leave here with tonight so we can feel better about the places that we live in, that we use, that we experience every day of our lives. Tonight's program continues NCPC's commitment to holding dynamic and timely conversations about some of the most important planning and design issues we face in the nation's capital. Washington is the civic heart of our nation, where locals and visitors celebrate, commemorate, demonstrate, and enjoy daily life. And we see all of that happening every day here in Washington. And we celebrate it. People deserve an open and safe experience from walking to work or enjoying a concert in a park. Our outdoor spaces host a variety of uses and programs from small and large urban parks to a street blocked off for a community event or an area that transformed to, to, to um, accommodate a national celebration. But ultimately, protecting people is also a top priority. By extension, we also protect our local economy. If there's a perception that a park or an event is unsafe, then people are wary about the area and, no, and will not attend, and nearby businesses are certainly going to feel the impact of that and the decreased foot traffic. So as much as, as such, we must simultaneously protect the functions and the city and its spaces all at the same time. Issues of security have been in the spotlight since the Oklahoma City bombing in 1995. And NCPC has been at the forefront of developing guidelines to address security in a thoughtful and balanced manner. Tonight, as stewards of public space and access, we all have to ask the question, what is acceptable risk? We know the recent events that public, with recent events, that public spaces such as parks remain a serious target, and as such, deserve a balanced approach to security. I'd like to thank the NCPC staff for organizing this distinguished panel to discuss, to discuss this diverse perspective on important, such an important issue. And once again, thanks to our partner, the American Society of Landscape Architects. Now I'd like to hand things over to Jess Zimbabwe, tonight's moderator, to get us started. Good evening, everybody. Tonight we have brought together experts from planning, infrastructure security, and design worlds to talk about this timely topic of how we balance security and access, how we make sure that people pay, stay safe in public spaces, but also that they maintain a sense of engagement and openness uh, that we've all come to expect from that public realm. So each of our three speakers is going to give a brief overview of their perspective on these issues, and then we'll all come up here for a facilitated discussion where we'll focus on how the professions can balance security and access. We also look forward to having questions from you, but speaking of access, you'll notice that this uh, theater is set up with very long rows, and many of you are very far from the aisle, so there are comment cards. If you have a question uh, that you'd like to put to the panel, if you didn't take a card on your way in, just raise your hand and we'll have an usher bring one to you and you can pass them along and do a favor for your neighbor uh, and pass them to the aisle and then we can take your questions and include them in the discussion. So to get us started, uh, please join me in welcoming our speakers tonight, Susan Silverberg, Chris Klein, and Gary Hildebrand. Thank you all. Tonight we're talking about security. Um, we're talking about safety, feeling secure, which I think also means feeling welcome. And we're talking about it in the relationship to public space, um, to the space that we know is a democratic society where we can come together in kind of a free and unfettered way um, to enjoy each other, um, to enjoy community um, and what is around us. 
Um, we're also talking about the balance between those two things. Um, as earlier uh, said, what is, what is the acceptable risk? What do we want to give up? What do we want to get um, from this discussion and this push and pull between these two things? Um, fortunately, from the design side, we have over half a century of um, important research on what makes good public spaces, uh, what makes it enjoyable to be out and in the community and in the civic realm. And those include things such as the importance of connectivity, of public spaces to other places and adjacent uses, and open access and feeling kind of free um, to move about as you might. It also includes this sense of humanity and being part of a larger group um, in a community and flexibility. We like to be able to come and go as we please, to move furniture, to think about how we want to adapt public space um, for our own needs and desires. And of course, beauty. Um, and the human scale are an important part of this and things that are pleasing to the eye um, that celebrate um, our ability to make things beautiful within the environment. And destinations, programming, and activities that bring public spaces to life um, and make us want to go and try new things and meet people uh, cross-culturally within our communities. All of that begs the question, how do security interventions affect those elements of public space that we know are so important um, for good design and for our kind of day-to-day -day quality of life. I want to talk you through some of the research um, that I've done at MIT that has looked at both the type of security interventions post 9-11 in the Boston Financial District, has uh, looked at the um, motivations for those interventions and the actors involved in that. And so we're looking at an area of the financial district in downtown Boston, uh, because it was particularly easy to, to document through the Boston Planning and Development Agency, then known as the BRA, before and after, uh, or certainly before. Um, and what we found through a series of field work over four months with my MIT research students is that um, there were quite a few interventions in the public realm, some of them temporary, some of them permanent, some of them designed, some of them more ad hoc. But there was also loss of um, use of some public space and loss of commercial space um, and amenities that were part of kind of the privately owned public space. And taken as a whole, those were considerable interventions in the public realm. What was surprising in the dozens of interviews we did with public officials and others who experienced this, no one said, well, we have a lot of interventions. In fact, most people said there haven't been many changes that we see, um, although they talked about experiencing some of them. And I liken these interventions a bit to the kind of space junk that's floating around, and you hear about old satellites and things, that it, it's kind of cumulative over time, that these invention, uh, interventions didn't just come all at once overnight, um, but that came over time until they accumulated as a kind of space junk where nothing related to anything else in some way. Um, it was also curious, um, the uh, Boston Redevelopment Authority at the time had a public policy that was actually tied to zoning um, and permitting. They really wanted to encourage through block connections in the Boston Financial District. Big blocks, bad weather in the winter. So really this idea of good urban design and the permeability of, um, of the urban space to get easily from one space to another and multiple choices. Um, and this is what that public realm looked like as documented by them through our enhanced mapping before 9-11. And then our research um, showed what public realm through blocks were closed with no knowledge from the Boston Redevelopment Authority, even though that these were permitting requirements um, originally for many of these buildings. And so, um, what we had was this a kind of erosion of movement through um, that also sent a stop, do not enter sign in another way, which was kind of the human security element within the financial district. And so we had a series of experiences as a research team, six graduate students and myself over the course of many months. Um, we all came from different cultures um, and went about things in a slightly different way. But we, we were trailed by security guards in Post Office Square, which is a privately owned and managed uh, public, uh, public park or public used park, because we were in a group of over four and they didn't want people congregating in that park. It was dangerous. 
We were stopped and ID'd and questioned by the GSA at the JFK Federal Building for taking pictures from a public sidewalk. Um, we were uh, questioned by security at South Station, the railroad station, because I was drinking coffee and writing on a map. Um, so wanting to see what materials I had. Uh, told that streets around the convention center were, not, were closed to pedestrians, even though they weren't. Um, and stopped and questioned uh, many times while taking photos of City Hall from public spaces. Um, so a, a sense of not only the physical and the kind of bricks and mortar interventions, but the kind of human interaction within that. And perhaps most disturbing of all, the Asian and Middle Eastern students on my research team were approached many more times in much more aggressive ways by security during the course of our research. And I, sent, I gave letters to all of them on MIT letterhead um, because concerns began to be raised. And so what resulted was this sense about um, a real um, mix of security interventions that over time became white noise. So no one was really noticing how pieces of our public realm and the ability for us to move freely in the civic space um, that we share was beginning to be eroded and chipped away. Um, and so um, seeing that and the permeability and that loss um, is, is really quite striking. Um, we started looking at other cities as well, including New York. I call this security creep. Um, this idea that over time, beginning in the 1960s, where incentive zoning um, really regulated privately owned public space, enjoyable for everyone, over time, various uh, terrorist events that have happened, then up to 9-11, where there was a big surge, kind of a shock, you know, interventions that occurred. And now what we see is, uh, in, you know, in the last 10 years, certainly in the last five, this surge in gun and vehicular um, attacks based on mass, you know, intent on mass destruction on crowds that has changed the discussion from one of how do we harden a target that's a bit easier to do in terms of a building to how, in fact, do we protect, this was the Time magazine cover from August, 253 cities from January through August of this year that experienced a mass shooting. Um, so that's pretty striking. And most of these events happen in what we call third places. So these are places that are neither home nor work, but they're the places where we come together as a civil society to work out our differences, to understand and celebrate those differences and to share kind of common experiences. And this is where those attacks have now gone, which really begins to beg the question, how do we approach this? Um, and what do we do to protect both that freedom that is really the kind of bedrock of our democratic society and the need to be safe. I want to answer the question by making sure that we understand the multiple motivations for security interventions. What we found in Boston is that there are very few, uh, very few of those interventions that we marked actually were the result of official and rigorous threat assessments. What we found through interviewing building owners, security professionals, building managers, um, uh, REITs, um, public officials, what we found multiple motivations for those security interventions that we've documented. The first one was market competition. Well, we manage these buildings. We're going to wait to see what the guy next door does. And then we're going to follow suit. Right? We need to keep up with the market. If they harden their target, we better harden ours and let's just flow it down the line till they go to someone else. But we need to be able to tell our tenants that we're doing what the next guy is doing. And then there's the peer pressure, right? Um, so clients traveling between New York City offices that may have been in kind of high threat areas were coming to Boston offices and they were saying, hey, wait a minute, there's better security in New York. Why don't you have it in Boston? And the liability, so this is a quote from a Boston design professional, apologies to the lawyers in the audience. If there's ever a lawyer on a building committee, liability comes up and security is put in. No questions asked and money gets shifted from one thing to the other. And profit motive. The office getting blitz, this is a major architecture firm in Boston, talked about just getting blitz, those were his words, with products and security interventions from product manufacturers after 9-11. Big, big business. And the implication being, if you don't do this for your clients, you're not giving them what they need, you will be at fault.
Um, and of course, funding is available. A colleague at MIT talked about secure urban design as the iced tea of the 21st century, right? If there's money available for security, it must solve all problems, right? Um, so let's, let's put it to good use. And lastly, I call it the prestige factor. We heard so many times that someone's building or a monument was in the top 10 terrorist threat. It was bragging rights. Um, this sense that if you're in the top 10, the agency you run or the building you manage or own is more important than somebody else's. And mathematically, this was impossible. I would know that without even teaching at MIT. Um, um, but really, this sense of the bragging rights of being on that top 10 list were really pretty striking. And so we have a set of actors that are really important to know because this isn't any one single decision that anybody makes. It's, it's a lot of actors not always working um, in concerted move forward and a lot of different motivations. And the part that we're talking about tonight is also what are the best practices? So how do we combine what I think of as a real knowledge of sociology and how people need and use public space to the studies that have been done, existing a security intervention assessment, sharing information which happens so little, and then collaboration and coordination. Um, and what I've done is the NCPC um, has uh, looked at a certain amount of um, um, design typologies for urban spaces. And I want to just talk a little bit from our research, some ideas about what might be um, some thoughts about design interventions here. They've talked about the, the public park in your neighborhood or the plaza in front of a public or a private building on the right, um, streets that might be closed for a street fair or a pedestrian or a bicycle event, and then the large urban park that might be used a few times a year for concerts or special events. And how do you think about those four spaces, which I think is the right approach in thinking about trying to standardize, thinking about how people use space and what they would expect. And, and thinking about what we know from our research about these kinds of spaces, I would say that all four types of spaces have some basic requirements when thinking about security. And one is that all security interventions should improve public space design and experience. We have limited resources. Planning is the allocation of scarce resources. When it comes from one thing to go to another, you better well make sure that that thing is used for as many good purposes as possible. And so, and I think that's particularly important on the first two instances. When you start getting into temporary uses, street closing or a concert in a park, you worry less about that because there are different expectations. A good example is the McCoy Federal Building, where look at the before and then look at the after. Good money spent on multiple purposes there. Uh, what a glorious space um, for the public. The second is coordinate and have rigorous threat assessments and application of best practices um, so that you really are looking across and you're asking the question, why are we doing this? Uh, which is a hard question to answer because there are many actors and motivations. Um, next is the pedestrianization of the public realm, of gathering spaces, restricted vehicular access could apply to all of these. Those are best practices that we see today in making cities walkable, in making um, better places for people to live in the complete streets movement. All of those practices help protect our environment and the people who use them. And, and that's a good thing to do. And then design of human security presence, and I'm a little uh, reluctant to do this because there's a gentleman coming after me who's in a, a uniform here, but I want to say the ambassadors versus security. What about putting security in just more approachable? You know, I think about the ambassadors in most of the bids, and they're called ambassadors for a reason. A lot of them keep their, their eye on security. They're a very welcoming presence, so thinking about how do we uh, protect with eyes on the street in ways that are more welcoming? And I understand there are reasons why you'd want the right, um, but thinking about what that is. Um, and then design that invites engagement with surroundings rather than zoning out. Um, so what I mean by that is you can have the right where everyone's at a cell phone solar charging station in your park and busy on their device. We're thinking about ways to use public art interactive digital media to engage people in public spaces in noticing the people next to them and their environment. So really thinking about how to use design to make some of that eyes on the street really come alive. 
Um, and then lastly, keep a scorecard for both security and public realm design because they are a balance. If we ever give up everything for security, the question is what do we have left? For what purpose have we done that? I would say for the plaza um, design, there aren't many things that would change for that in this overall view. Private owner and public sector coordination, if it's a privately owned building and plaza, thinking about that public and private interface. Um, for a streetscape closure, um, when you start to get into temporary uses, design guidelines change in terms of application and thinking about, yes, it's possible you might do checkpoints um, depending on the number of building owners or what the event is or restrictions on personal property. A good example is Jersey Street outside of Boston Red Sox um, Stadium where there are now checkpoints so that the street can be open for food and drink before the game. And everyone accepts the fact that that's kind of an extension of the stadium now. And it seems like a reasonable request to ask of people to go through security. And lastly, the large urban parks the same thing, when you're going to a concert or an event, there is an expectation that you might need a ticket or a special event access. So different kinds of um, security measures because they're not the kind of day-to-day -day free flow that we expect in our urban environment. Um, so I really wanna stop there and not take any more time and emphasize this notion, really understanding all the actors at play the motivations that can be there and the best practices and really asking the question, why are we doing this and for what purpose and what is the acceptable level of risk um, can lead us to better public spaces that are as safe as they can be within our open democratic society. Thank you. Kind of hard to follow someone from MIT, but I'll give it a shot. <laughs> um, so we're going to talk about uh, how do we best understand the ranges of threats to those occupying public spaces. My agency, which is the Federal Protective Service, or FPS, is a very small law enforcement uh, organization within the Department of Homeland Security. We're responsible for protecting um, over a million federal employees and contractors and about 9,000 federal facilities throughout the country and territories. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about threats here in a few minutes. Uh, they can happen anywhere. You've seen recent attacks at government buildings, religious institutions, schools, festivals, shopping malls, and entertainment districts. Just for the federal community over the last 10 years, we've had about 130 actual attacks against federal facilities and, and employees. Uh, this has resulted in 45 federal employees uh, dying and over 100 being injured and millions of dollars in damage. Uh, during the same time period, uh, the FBI has uh, uh, prevented about 50 plots that were directed towards federal facilities. Um, so a lot of threats going out across the country. You know, you can name a thousand of them just off the top of your head. We have to aggravate all, or aggregate all that threat data into something that actually makes sense. Uh, we get threat information from a variety of sources, FBI, DHS fusion centers, city, county, state, and other local law enforcement partners. Um, so let's talk about threat data in the Pacific Northwest. Anybody from uh, Portland, Seattle, anywhere? Okay. Um, so our threat data in the Pacific Northwest highlights demonstrations, some with violence, as a area of our concern. As an example, last Friday during a peaceful climate change demonstration, a group of about 30 individuals broke away from the main demonstration group of about 1,000 people, went to a federal building and began throwing rocks at windows and at federal police officers. Um, they were sub subsequently arrested. Now in the northeast area, anybody from Boston, uh, New York, uh, that area, our threat data indicates that foreign terrorist organizations continue to be a threat in that area. Uh, just last week, the Department of Justice announced the indictment of an individual named Alexi Saab, uh, from Morristown, New Jersey, who allegedly conducted surveillance of possible target locations, including government buildings in New York City, in order to help a foreign terrorist organization prepare for potential future attacks against the United States. All right, so what do you do if this guy shows up at the front door of your building? So on uh, this end of his name is 22-year-old uh, Brian Isaac Clyde, 
On June 17, 2019, at 8.35 a.m., Mr. Clyde arrived at the Federal Building and U.S. Courthouse in Dallas and fired 13 rounds into the entrance of the building. Before Mr. Clyde began his attack, our security officers uh, noticed him exit his vehicle dressed in this uh, with the rifle in his hand. And, um, you know, we, of course, we do a lot of planning and preparation. The security officers notified the command center. Uh, they ushered about 30 people off the sidewalk. Um, and then they took up a defensive position in the lobby. Um, and subsequently, Mr. Clyde uh, was shot and killed. But this can happen anywhere. You saw a Walmart in El Paso, of all places. Um, a bar district in Dayton, Ohio. Um, this is not unusual anymore. This has kind of become normal. Um, but the threats continue to evolve. Make sure I'm on the right slide here. So traditional threats, we deal with a lot of these locally. These include the street level crimes that our federal employees deal with when they're getting off the metro or getting off the train or getting off a bus and walking to or from their federal facility. Um, uh, a lot of homeless in the uh, inner city areas that tend to uh, want to ask our federal employees for cash. Uh, and if the word is no, they may end up being stabbed. Um, we're keenly focused on emerging threats. Um, Ten years ago, I don't think we ever thought we'd see vehicles being used as weapons. Um, cyber and unmanned aircraft system threats uh, are becoming more uh, prevalent for us. And we're working with our stakeholders, which are the tenants of our federal facilities, to deter, mitigate, and defend against these threats. Regarding domestic terrorism, just last week, DHS Acting Secretary Kevin McAleenan introduced a strategic framework for countering terrorism and targeted violence to address and prevent the mass attacks that have too frequently struck houses of worship, schools, workplaces, festivals, and shopping spaces. Key focus for the Department of Homeland Security as our country faces growing threats from domestic terrorism and targeted violence. So how do we determine an appropriate security level? This is the toughest question in the world. Um, do you put up barriers, bollards, blast walls, you name it? Um, uh, for us, um, we have to plan for who's in the building, what do they do, what type of activities do they perform? Um, and I think we're pretty fortunate for the federal community, the government facility sector, we use the interagency security committee. Is everyone familiar with that? I know the NCPC folks are part of that, the interagency security committee. But they have uh, standards that uh, are in place. One is the risk management process for federal facilities, which defines the criteria and process to determine the facility security level. Every federal facility have a, has a FSL, for uh, facility security level, ranges from one to five. One is the Pentagon and CIA headquarters, uh, I'm sorry, a five is CIA headquarters and a one would be a, a social security office in a shopping mall somewhere in Ames, Iowa. Um, so the FSL is done first and then provides an integrated single source of physical security countermeasures for all federal facilities. Uh, we identify and assess the risk to federal facilities using a ISC compliant computer-based risk assessment tool. Our tool measures the current baseline level of protection that's required by the ISC. Uh, compares that to the current security countermeasures at a specific facility and then provides recommendations to get the facility to that baseline level of protection. Um, the assessment process considers both the environment of the facility, where it's located, what goes on in that neighborhood, as well as security needs of those being protected. Um, a book repository in Butte, Montana with two employees but a million square feet full of books is not a high threat. Um, the Reagan building here in D.C. that's got CBP officers, USAID, EPA, um, that's a little bit more of a threat that we have to focus on. We then work with the occupants of the facility to put the necessary countermeasures in place to meet that baseline level of protection uh, while still allowing the mission of the agencies and departments to continue. So I know we want to get to the question and answer session here, but before we run out of time, let's quickly discuss some strategies and best practices employed when addressing security demands during events and public gatherings. We average about 1,000 demonstrations at federal facilities uh, every year. It's been an increase over the last couple of years, um, but, but uh, it doesn't, for us, it doesn't matter what the issue is. You know, every American uh, has the right to uh, demonstrate. Um, most of our demonstrations are peaceful, First Amendment protected activities. We, we try to be aware of these demonstrations beforehand so we can notify the occupants of the federal facilities 
that there's going to be a demonstration on your sidewalk from 11 to 12 tomorrow. Uh, you may want to let your employees know to use the back door. This may be a little confrontational depending on what the issue is. You may not want them to be out intermingling with the demonstrators. We're going to let them demonstrate, get their voices heard, and then um, let them go on their way. So yesterday morning, anybody have any trouble getting in yesterday? Some demonstrations throughout D.C., some boats out in the intersections, people dancing and chaining themselves to the boats. It was a little crazy. Uh, we became aware of, those of the climate change demonstrations and the attempt to shut down D.C. Uh, early last week. Uh, we worked with our stakeholders here in the National Capital Region to make them aware of this, and we recommended that you, you may want to consider offering telework to your employees um, that aren't considered essential um, or unscheduled leave because we don't know if they're going to show up or not. Uh, we don't know if they're going to block the 14th Street Bridge, Massachusetts Avenue, who knows what. But you're going to lose a pro lot of productivity for your employees if they're sitting out on 395 or on Route 50 trying to get in. Maybe it's best to telework. And a lot of our agencies did that because they just were concerned. They didn't want their employees to be involved in that thing. Um, so the good thing is most people stayed home. The demonstrators did their business. I was a little concerned about getting home uh, last night. Are they going to come back? But um, uh, luckily they didn't. Our goals during these demonstrations is to not only protect the federal facility and the employees, but also ensure the protection of the demonstrators. So not everyone agrees with the, the cause of the demonstration. Um, you know, we've got anybody who's from Portland. Did I ask that question earlier? A lot of activity in Portland with, the, um, with a little bit of Antifa going on out there, and then you've got the Proud Boys, which when you get those two together, they tend to want to fight. Um, and you've seen a lot of effort between the Portland Police Bureau, uh, the Federal Protective Service, the local jurisdictions, and keeping those groups apart, especially when they're protesting on, uh, there's actually a GSA-owned uh, park in Portland. And, and if they're coming on that park, we don't want them to be uh, fighting each other. Um, so we try to keep them separate. So before I close, I wanted to provide you with a quote from Timothy McVeigh. McVeigh, anybody remember Timothy McVeigh, 1995? Um, killed 168 people, federal employees, including 19 children. Um, from his prison cell, Mr. McVeigh wrote some, some memoirs, I guess you would call it, and one said, I chose to bomb a federal building because such an action served more purposes than other options. Foremost, the bombing was a retaliatory strike, a counterattack for the cumulative raids that federal agents had participated in over the preceding years. And he was specifically speaking of Ruby Ridge and Waco, and you remember those um, uh, incidents. Uh, balancing security and access to public spaces is a dynamic challenge. We thank the NCPC and all of you for working with us and allowing us to partner with you as we come up with solutions. I think you're well aware we protect all GSA-owned and leased facilities. We don't own any building. Uh, but we know that there is uh, a much better process to how security is implemented at these facilities than the current process. We can't keep throwing up jersey walls on the sidewalks, uh, having guards and x-rays, magnetometers, cameras, you name it, uh, that just look terrible uh, to our citizens that come, especially in D.C. These people are coming to see the nation's capital and the home of democracy, and all they see is things like this. So we want to do better. We want to work with you on that and how we can mitigate those. Uh, thank you for having us, and we look forward to the question and answer session. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Very sobering, Chris. Um, I'm not sure I can follow somebody from Homeland Security, but I'll do my best. Thank you for having me. I'm going to have to explain my title, but it's a little more optimistic. Um, earlier this year, I got a call from the Canadian Center of Architecture, a curator, who said to me, we want to put a piece of your work in an exhibition called Our Happy Life. And I kind of went like, mm, really? <laughs> um, but as they described their interest, I became really keen. I'm going to give you two case studies tonight, some responses to what Susan and Chris have spoken about tonight. Because I'm a designer, I'm not a security expert, uh, far from it. Um, Our Happy Life is an exhibition, its subtitle is called Architecture and Well-Being, 
in the age of emotional capitalism. So once they started to tell me a little bit more about this, about the fact that people and cities are investing in well-being, then I became interested. And they were keen to display our work in Tampa, Florida. There were two other projects, in, one in Tokyo, one in Copenhagen, that deal with qualities and characteristics of our urban environment that make people feel welcome and healthful. Now, uh, we're working on a very big project in Tampa, Florida. It's a renovation of 53 acres of a downtown which had been decimated in the early part of the 20th century. Um, the details of that are not important, but what's interesting in this context is that our project in Tampa has been evaluated by the well standard, and it's the first well community. The well community standard impacts individuals, not just within the walls of buildings or public or homes or workplaces, but throughout the public spaces where they spend their day. A well community functions to protect health and well-being across all aspects and all areas of community life. Resources are used effectively <coughs> equitably and responsibly. In some ways, I think this has been the mandate for landscape architecture for a very long time. It's being articulated and measured and promoted, and I think it is what we do now. We work on well-being. The well standard evaluates the quality of the air, water, nourishment, light, fitness, temperature, acoustics, materials, and where they come from and how they perform, issues of education and the mind, community and innovation. This is a new thing, um, but I think in some ways it's an old thing, and I have it on good authority. Vitruvius, 2,000 years ago, said the architect, I'm gonna say the planner, the urbanist, the landscape architect, should also have knowledge of the study of medicine, think broadly about what that means, on account of questions of climate, air, the healthiness and unhealthiness of sites, and the use of different waters. This is a prediction of the work we do today, 2,000 years ago. And that's how I want to situate our two case studies for how we respond to the kinds of assessments that Rick talked about. The first one is in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where my practice is and where my home is and where I teach. And it is a new facility for the Department of Transportation, the very vaunted Volpe Transportation Center where some of the smartest people on earth are working on transportation safety and transport mobility issues at large. This is a building in a pretty dense part of the downtown, but 14 acres that are not so dense it's going to all be redeveloped, and this building will go into construction early next year. So we have completed construction documents for this project with SOM, the architects, and a very large team of people uh, and uh, professionals, and also the, um, the GSA has been our client, along with the DOT. It's a, it's a building in a dense part of the city, but if you look at this image, which is a rendering, you will see that it has a standoff area. Uh, what, it's, what I want to brag about here is that part of our approach to security in the standoff area was to involve the artist Maya Lin. This is a collaboration with a friend of mine, Maya Lin, and this is part of how we think about making people feel good in an area that is fully about protection but also about other things. So again, it looks a little suburban, right? Because that is the 75 feet standoff. The building is the white. There's a street on the, on the right that's Fifth Street, which we will be building anew to connect to an existing Fifth Street. And there's what the assessment says. You gotta protect this. You gotta protect it in a few different ways. Now, this is all the loading and vehicles entering the facility, right? So we've got to protect those edges. This is where people are 
able to walk and it was really fantastic that the GSA and the DOT said, we want people to walk right past the front door. We're not going to keep people away from the building, but that means we have to uh, employ some very clever tactics to still make sure that the facility and the uh, employees and the citizens are safe. Where do we pile snow? How do we drain the site? How do we drain it sustainably and recharge the water? So my point here is that security is a part of a multifunction demand. It's not only what the assessment for security says, but also all of the other aims that GSA puts forward for us, they're very high on sustainability and resilience. And so this is the site plan. And during the course of about two years of planning and design, our attitude, our collective attitude towards the level of armoring changed. As we devised ways that the landscape could absorb energy, could stop a truck, and so on. I, um, I can't give you the, all the details here. I mean, you can see that the, the red lines are absolute hardening. Those are K-12, if you know the parlance. But uh, in the end, even a 75-foot setback could become a work of art. And I, so we think this is um, really a, 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 a way of innovating, let's say, with the demands of security in a facility like that. So we look forward to uh, the completion of that. Working on the Alamo is maybe one of the most challenging things that um, my colleagues and I have ever done. And this is really an interesting, there's some innovation in this as well. The Alamo has always been considered by San Antonians the center of civic life. Every Texan thinks of Alamo as the creation myth or the creation reality of Texas, of their Texas. If you go there today, seven million people a year do, World Heritage Site, all of you in the room would agree that it's kind of compromised and it's not welcoming and it's not about well-being. Uh, it has a lot of distractions. And one of the things here is that protest, as we know in Washington above all, requires witness. And so if there's something to fight about or re raise questions about in San Antonio, you know where you're gonna go, right? Right in front of the Alamo so it can be telegraphed on TV that night or of course now across your phone screen. The parades, the buses, right where this photograph is taken on the right is a Ripley's Believe It or Not. So the Alamo has been mistreated over the years. Um, and so we had to change this. But for about 20 years, there has been an effort to come to agreement on the plan for the Alamo. We finally did that last year. The City Council of San Antonio passed a resolution accepting the plan as presented, and the state governor, uh, the Texas Land Office, approved the plan as well because this is such an important destination. Now, understand that it's a funny old illustration, but here's Alamo Church. And this is Alamo Street, and there are buildings here, but the mission, San Valerio, the Alamo, was all of that. So more than half of the mission had been erased over time. And there are lots of people who think that should be gotten back, and there are quite a few that don't. I want to go just a little bit to the organization here. Nobody likes organizational charts, but I want to tell you the reason that I believe we got a plan approved after a 20-year process. It was bringing stakeholders together, these folks who are identified at the bottom of the screen, 30 people, 
appointees, including descendants of defenders, local business people, teachers, historians, experts, and for two years, they got together once a month, and the outcome of their work was a single page of objectives that they could all agree to. No plan, just a set of objectives. And this then, I mean, it's not without controversy, but we have now got a plan because of the clarity and also the conviction of so many stakeholders representing their groups and their neighbors. And so we're making a plan now. We're in design since the plan was approved. So, you know, there's uh, Alamo Church, and that's what it was thought to be. And there was Alamo Plaza. That's the historic site with roads and buildings sitting atop it. This is something you see in Rome when you go there, right? We don't have sites like this really in the US very much. And the plan really rethinks this entire precinct. And it allows for Alamo Plaza to be an even larger condition, but it also gains back the historic site. There's the plan, a kind of rendering of the plan. So a little bit of explanation. So, one, there's archaeology. So we were preserving the artifacts of the church, the barracks, the walls, and so on. And in order to allow you to understand that precinct, which is so important, we actually make a slight drop in grade. So there's a boundary created. Security involves a lot about boundaries. And we inscribe the footprint of the original mission. That's pretty strong. Then the volume of the mission is the open plaza. And then we can tell all of the varied stories. Today, basically, there's one narration which is about the Battle of the Alamo and all the stuff that goes with that. But there are many other stories. There are Native American stories. There are burials. There are lots and lots of stories. There are stories about slavery. So living history would take place in this precinct. That's very helpful. Now I want to go to the boundary, which is the re really the reason to talk about this, because I think there's something a bit unusual. First of all, we make this slight depression, and we know that that entails some work on our part as designers to make sure that that's not an impediment to anyone moving through the precinct. So there will certainly be sloping walks and steps and um, seats and so on. When we need a fence, we have the ability now to put the fence in planting even when we need a high wall, as there has been for about 100 years around the back precinct of what's called the garden at the Alamo. We also can shroud that in vegetation. So we're placing a boundary that works for security, but we're really trying to make it seem like something else, in this case, a garden wall. And at the museum, which is now going to um, involve relocating the entrance to the Alamo, now well across the street. This is exactly where Ripley's Believe It or Not is now. Believe it or not. <laughs> um, we will have overlooks, and we will have places where you can see the archaeological remains that are now under the street. So that way of thinking about the boundary has an, yet another implication. So here we're looking at the visitor center and uh, portion of the museum. It looks a little different now. This is maybe a couple of months out of date, where you have now a sense of the precinct of the original mission where the battle took place. So one of the reasons that it was so difficult to get to a plan in San Antonio was because there was a strong belief on the part of quite a strong faction that you should not 
close Alamo Street. You should be able to go right in front of the Alamo because we've always been able to do that. But the, the group, right, the, the committee said, no, we're going to change this. And they built consensus around it. There are still people who don't think it's the case. But, um, so we have this historic core, and you have active interpretation in the core during the day. In the evening, it doesn't have to be closed. So this boundary is going to be permeable. We're going to have gates that open at night. This is, in some ways, a reverse of what we do in so many public spaces. But this was a way that we could get agreement on closing the plaza in the first place. We're not fully closing the plaza. We're not allowing cars through it. But at night, people can, in fact, traverse through. And we can have public events and so on. And there's a deal. The mayor has two days a year. Texas Land Office has a couple of days a year. You know, you make these um, arrangements. Very important. Free speech events. Those that I mentioned that show up at the Alamo so that they can be on TV will not be in front of the Alamo. So like the National Park Service has been doing in so many of its assets, we now designate an area in the plaza but not in the mission for free speech events. And so that can happen and will. And we move the cenotaph, which is right now in front of the Alamo and is a controversy in itself, so it stands there today. We move that in front of the Metzger Hotel and that's where, um, let's say, lots of different kinds of activities can happen, including large gatherings like this. And the implication of this way of rethinking a boundary is that we protect the visitor experience and all of the benefit that comes with that during the day when 7 million people a year come. And we also give this street back to the city at night. So that's what San Antonio is committed to, an open ground for listening and learning, a place for commingling stories and perceptions. It's a space of shared liberty, a space of well-being. The Battle of 1836 wrested a claim for sovereignty, that's Texas independence, out of conflict and division. We've talked about division. There's a lot of division. Yet we're more divided today than we were yesterday, aren't we? Um, but political and cultural divisiveness seem present everywhere we look. The politics of division have brought into focus a lot of misery at the southern border, just a few miles from here, and we know this. Um, and at the Alamo itself, a lot of discord over how to protect our treasured heritage still lingers. But the results of patient civic engagement, that committee, are demonstrating the rewards of a different way forward. If we're willing to speak and listen to those with whom we disagree, then maybe we can overcome division. Further, I think we can tease apart selective memories of the past, some of which had been scrubbed away at the Alamo, to arrive at a more integrated cultural understanding of who we are, where we come from, and where we're headed. In doing so, we honor the democratic traditions of liberty, which come alive as history is rewritten by the people, martyrs, victors, witnesses, marchers, protesters, and chroniclers. Thank you. Thank you all. Those were really enlightening presentations and I think set a good context for this conversation. Um, I thought we could start with a sort of basic question of, the, you know, we've been talking about risk and is there an acceptable level of risk, right? Because every time you leave your house, you, you're taking on some risk. So how do you personally or professionally 
define what would be acceptable risk, and then how do we, when we come together in big deliberative bodies like NCPC or the Alamo Commission, hmm. collectively decide what's an appropriate level of risk in a space? <laughs> Looking at me. Um, so it's, it's, it's tough to make that decision um, on what's acceptable. Mm -hmm. uh, because like Mr. Clyde, who you saw up here, he could end up at the front door of your house, at a Social Security office, uh, upset about the denial of a benefit, or at a courthouse uh, because he's upset about people aren't providing for the Constitution. Um, so for us, we utilize uh, the tenants in the building. You know, what is acceptable to the tenants in the building? Um, each federal facility has a facility security committee that's comp comprised of the, the, um, a representative from each agency. And we go over that assessment that we talked about earlier, the risk assessment to that facility. That is, uh, it, it we do a threat assessment report to that building, what are the threats to the building. The tenets of the building is very important. If a, a agency inside the building is controversial, um, you know, we've had a lot of activity at ICE facilities lately, um, then there's, there's some risk that we may not want to accept there. But if it's a, a non-controversial agency that um, uh, no one has any issues with, then there may be a level of risk that's accepted. But we put it on the tenants. What are you willing to accept? What are you willing to accept for your employees that come here every day or your customers, Social Security Administration, um, people were in there every day to apply for a benefit. Um, a benefit may have been denied last week, and now they're upset about it. What's acceptable there? Um, so it's a balance that, that we rely heavily on the, the, tenant, the agencies inside those federal facilities to make that decision. Right. We don't want to tell them that, that's, that we're going to accept that risk because there's really no risk that, that we want to accept unless we have to. Right. I think um, I think the other side of that is that there are many spaces and third places where there is not the expertise or the kind of single owner or overseer who can make that assessment. And it gets back to what are the actors and the motivations. And so that's the difficult part because there is no one person who can or is willing to make that assessment of what's an uh, acceptable risk for a kind of larger group of people. And so that's a very difficult thing. Who makes the determination if you close a street for a street festival, mm -hmm. uh, for a bid, let's say? Mm -hmm. Is it the bid? What about the private building owners? Or maybe the uh, event company that's running the event? You know, How do you make that assessment? And, and uh, the need for coordination kind of a structure and rigor about how one would go about that. Mm -hmm. It seems in some ways your system has to be adapted. It almost needs to be like a kit, right? <laughs> you know, how do you make those assessments? What are some of the steps that you would go through? Because right now, my research shows it's an ad hoc process. Right. You know. Mm -hmm. it, I was pleased to learn through the course of working with a GSA on the Volpe Transportation Center that um, certain things were pretty hard and fast, but they were adaptive mm -hmm. to creative landscape solutions. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I live in a world of subjectivity, you know, and we measure a lot of things, but in the end, you know, I think design is a very indeterminate and subjective thing. I never want us to lose that. Uh, design has to be imaginary and imaginative, but I, yeah, but I will say that you know at first it was very daunting um, because the first diagram looked pretty scary to us. But as we worked and worked and worked through and just ways of thinking about how landscape could protect and also um, bring positive benefits, mm -hmm. that that told me that you know it can be adaptive. Mm -hmm. Your comment about at first, it looked scary and working and working. I think that really brings home the point that it's important to plan outside of the crisis moment. Mm -hmm. That the, the shock reaction and the reactionary planning is not the time to be doing this, right? Because we're always planning right. for the past. We're always one step behind, right. really. And But thinking ahead and making those decisions where you actually can have an iterative design process and the kinds of discussions 
that are really important to come to a very um, uh, well thought out with great intent, you know, what is going to happen is critical. Right. Yeah. Great. Um, the next thing I wanted to talk about was how do you prioritize the different types of threats? We saw, especially in your presentation, Chris, a lot of different categories. And so there's obviously some that are very clearly intentional, right? An active shooter. Um, but there are also risks of a vehicle plowing into people, whether that's driven with someone by intentionality, like in Charlottesville, or by someone who's under the influence or evading law enforcement. And those seem somewhat different. So how do you think about all those or weigh those or prioritize any of the different kinds of threats that are out there in thinking about security in the public realm? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, if you remember after 9-11, um, it was barriers, bollards, walls, mm -hmm. guards, guns, cameras. I mean, it got crazy. And, and it's going to have to change because just... Just in, in our agency, we spend about a billion dollars a year on, on security officers, contract security guards. It's a billion dollars that could be going somewhere else. Um, and I'm a veteran, and I, every morning I come in to work and I go past the uh, uh, Snyder homeless shelter on First Street, and I see veterans there, and I'm thinking, maybe that money could be used to help these guys or help someone yep. other than, than throwing it at, 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 at security. But... I know that if someone gets into a federal building with a gun like Mr. Clyde, then more than likely me or my boss would be on the hill the next day trying to explain why we need to keep our jobs uh, because we failed in our mission of preventing some, uh, someone from getting killed. So the prioritization is a daily event. Yeah. Um, uh, you're actively aware of, of issues in the Middle East. Um, uh, in Saudi Arabia, there were some uh, storage tanks that were recently uh, hit with uh, unmanned aero systems and some missiles. And what's going to be the reaction to that? And is there an issue? Do, do we here in the United States need to be concerned about something going on in the Middle East? More than likely, there's a chance of retaliation if we strike someone. Um, so that's high on our plate right now. Uh, Mr. Clyde is high on our plate every day now because um, a lot of people will call a federal agency and make threats. And it's normally uh, over a personal grievance. Um, I applied for a benefit, you denied my benefit, I, uh, I, I seeked resolution to that, and you denied that. Those, that's meals for my family, and now I'm gonna come down and, and kill you. Um, and that happens a lot. So our, we, wanna, we want that call to be made. Uh, we wanna go to the house where the call came from and knock on the door and sit down with the person who made that threat. Um, let's talk about the call you just made. Um, what keeps us up at night is when someone doesn't call uh, and they show up like Mr. Clyde did uh, back in June, uh, armed to the teeth, ready to make attacks. So the prioritizing threats, you know, luckily for us, we do have within DHS the Intelligence and Analysis Directorate. We also, we, we spend a lot of time, effort, and, and staffing to put our special agents on FBI Joint Terrorism Task Forces, which is key to staying on top of threats throughout the United States. Um, but the, the hard part is those people that don't make threats. The shooter in El Paso didn't really make any threats on social media other than just some kind of weird stuff. And same with the shooter in, in, in Dayton. They didn't really announce on social media that they were going to go shoot at Walmart. They just did it. Um, so prioritization comes every day, and, and you have to change every day based on what's going on in the, in the world. Mm -hmm. Anything in your research or design projects that make you think differently about different kinds of threats, or does it all... When you talk to security professionals in your research, they're, 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 lo they're looking at the whole range. Okay. They're looking at the whole range and often reacting to the last yeah. threat. Yeah. It's hard to understand what the future is. I mean, you can take a guess, right, talking right. about the, the tanks, right. being, you know, thinking about what that might be. But it's, it, you're always thinking and designing for what happened. It's hard to almost imagine what it might be. Mm -hmm. so. um, I have a question here. Uh, it's mostly for you, Gary, I think, although others may have perspectives on it about specifically talking about some great landscape solutions and design solutions mm -hmm. for a lot of these issues. Um, but as we all know, in design projects, those kind of things can be value engineered out of a project, right? When cost concerns come up. 
how does this emphasis on security change conversations about cost and what we can afford and what we can't and value in the environment? I would say that um, with the GSA, um, I, I fully believe they will not let down on security. Mm -hmm. We might value engineer other things out. We took some big hits on the project, um, changing materials and you know, really reconsidering um, material assignments and, and some landscape measures without, uh, I think, without deteriorating the design intentions, but definitely no compromise on the security part okay. there. Uh, that's the government building for the government. So um, I think when it comes to institutions, um, I do a lot of work at Harvard and at MIT and Williams College and you know other universities and art museums, and I think it's much more vulnerable there. I don't think we also have the same level of assessment. We don't um, fully consider uh, the matters that these two have spoken so beautifully about tonight. Um, but when we do, uh, sometimes those are quite vulnerable to, mm -hmm. you know, the thing about uh, every landscape architect knows is that the last thing you buy just before the furniture, the last thing you buy is the landscape. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, you know, if the project has taken a massive cost hit, the landscape is going to feel that hit. Mm -hmm. um, Anyway, I, 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 I'll hand it to the GSA again. They, uh, they won't compromise on safety and well-being. So the facility that you designed in, in Boston, the Department of Transportation facility, is, looks very similar to the U.S. courthouse in Miami, the new courthouse. Yeah. The standoff distance, the, the, mm -hmm. the hills that are built in, yeah. um, you know, people don't really recognize that that's, that's to prevent a vehicle from striking the side of the building. Right. Um, yep. But it, it allows us to kind of bring it down a little bit. You know, we've got this standoff distance that we don't have on Pennsylvania Avenue. Don't. Um, uh, you know, we, we wanted to, so we had an issue at, CIS has a building at 111 Mass Avenue here in D.C. Um, and, and a couple years ago, around December, a, a truck hit the side of the building, broke glass. I mean, it was quite a mess. And, and the response was, oh, my God, they're, they're going to blow the building up. Um, and the investigation was it was a traffic accident. Someone hit the truck, the driver was texting or drinking coffee, whatever, lost control and hit the building. Um, but the first question was, how did the truck hit the building? How, where are the vehicle barriers to prevent that truck from hitting the building? Um, so we looked into a little bit. We had just done an assessment on that facility and we recommended vehicle barriers. Uh, but working with the city uh, in that area, the, the sidewalks, are not capable of holding the heavy weight of a, of a large concrete planter. Um, and CIS is moving to a new facility uh, in Maryland like next week. I mean, this is coming up. So they decided we're not, we're not going to spend the money to do this because we're moving. But damn, if a truck didn't hit the building. Accident, but it could have been on purpose. Um, so if we can do what you've done uh, in New York, and, and, or I'm sorry, in Boston, and what was done in Miami, that really allows people, it, it's going to be cheap. It's going to cost a little bit more in the, in the beginning, but in the long run, instead of spending a billion dollars a year on contract security guards and cameras and pop-up barriers and whatnot, it, we're going to reduce that cost. And it, and it looks nice. It's not the, the fortress of, of Fort Knox. Well, that solves or it answers the requirement I really have for my research is that every security intervention should somehow improve the mm. public realm. And if mm. you think about our move toward complete streets and thinking about separated bike lanes, all of those things can have built in that kind of perimeter protection to harden those targets without <coughs> it with also having another purpose. I, I'm struck, and I think it's it's tapered off a little bit, but after 9-11 and talking a few years out, a lot of um, building company CEOs in Boston uh, were very frank with me off the record that looking, um, if when they have to think about relocating, 
they now think about things such as, actually, we don't want to be right next to South Station and the train mm -hmm. station. It's a target. We're going to go somewhere else. And looking at the GSA kind of standoff regulations, one thinks, well, that's suburban. And you've done an amazing job of working that in and having it feel like this kind of lush, really vibrant urban environment. But it is this kind of shift, and I think it's tapered a little bit for non-federal buildings, but any attack, God forbid, in the future, is going to, it's going to be right back on the table about do we want to be in the center of the city? Like what is the most valuable real estate now for a company headquarters? And maybe that's not it. <coughs> but I'm also struck in interviewing the head of the Boston Region National Park Service. And he talked about the challenges of uh, the Boston Navy Yard and keeping the USS Constitution, our oldest active you know, warship, um, going. And he talked about the, the shift in allocation of funds mm -hmm. to security. And the terms he used, it was so, he said, you know, Susan, we are eating our young here. Like, I can't. It was like this striking. We, we can't. We're losing money in programming and restoration because we're not getting more. It's just kind of shifting in terms of what the requirement is. And it's got to go somewhere, right? It has, it has to come from somewhere, and it's getting shifted. Really interesting. You know, in your, your remarks and your talks, we saw a number of physical solutions. Um, and I want to ask a little bit about the less visible, the unseen, the imperceivable security measures that sometimes cameras, facial recognition software. And I have sort of a three-part question on it. How effective are they, those kind of measures? How do they change human behavior? And then third, like how freaked out should we be by them, right? I mean, we've seen there was sort of viral footage in Hong Kong of the protesters pulling down the pole that had the camera facial recognition software. And that's under a, a more um, a less free and open regime than our current government. But in our government, should we be freaked out? And if you say zero freaked out, I'm going to be, that's going to freak me out even more. So. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that smile he's got. <laughs> So are, are, are those kind of unseen security camera, facial recognition software measures effective? How do they change behavior? And what are the civil liberties concerns? <laughs> lot of, so we have not moved to facial recognition at cameras at federal buildings. Now, there's a lot of other places where there are facial recognition. Coming in, I was in Mexico last month at a conference. And coming in, have you done the, you've done that whole uh, expedited yeah. uh, frequent fly or whatever where you go and they do your image and you're in the system. Clear. Yeah. Um, yeah, right. Whether you want to be or not, you are in the system. Yep. Um, but we haven't moved to that. There's so much privacy impact that goes into this. Um, within DHS, there's one of the largest offices is the Office of Civil Rights and Civil Liberties that um, pays close attention to any activities you're trying to, to update or upgrade. Um, but within DHS, uh, you may have heard of a system called continuous monitoring. Um, so, DHS employee, if I get pulled over tonight by the Virginia State Police on my way home, um, DHS is going to know about that tomorrow. Um, and it's primarily focused on, you know, your security clearance level, how, what do we need to pay attention to, because in the, in the government, typically every five years, they come back and do a, a, a refresher of your background investigation, they ask you, have you been arrested in the last five years? Now they don't have to ask. Um, because that gets into um, behavior, you know, what is this employee doing? He's got a top secret clearance, he's out drunk driving, or he got arrested for domestic violence, which is even worse. Um, we're going to have to pay attention to, the, to this person. So that's actively going on now, but it's not something, it's not a camera in front of your, your door. Um, and then an issue for us is uh, the insider threat. So these are when you go to a federal building, normally if you work there, you show your credential, you swipe at some type of reader, the door opens and you go in. Um, you don't go through screening that may be done for a visitor that's coming to see you that's going through an x-ray magnetometer, bag check, the whole works. But that employee just got in and he wasn't screened. You know, I can't tell you that every federal employee is good to go, you know, um, because they, there's a lot of grievances that go on within the work work. Place, you know, supervisors, subordinate relationships, especially time for a mid-year or end-of-year review, bonuses being passed out. You know, people get upset about this, um, and we don't clear those people. We don't we don't screen them. Uh, we have implemented some programs at some of our facilities where we we do random checks. We'll roll a, a, a dice and get a number, and then that number every fourth federal employee coming in goes through screening. 
it's really fun to see the reaction when they're told to go through screening, because now we're going to look through the lunchbox and see what they have in there. Um, um, uh, Lower Manhattan Security Initiative, is anybody aware of this? Uh, this is a program that was put in place after 9-11, like everything else. Uh, NYPD, DHS leveraged uh, local community cameras, so Chase Bank headquarters, um, a number of headquarters in Lower Manhattan, where NYPD now has access to their cameras because they're looking for crimes to see what's going on in the community. Um, Chase, Chase Bank gets to have a representative in that command center where they can now see the cameras in the subway, the cameras down the street, and they can notify their, their building, hey, an incident just happened down here. Tell our employees not to go right when they go out the front door. Tell them to go left because there's a shooting down the street. So that's really been pretty productive. Uh, we've been up there several times. Our, our cameras at our federal facilities are tied into that network. Um, and it's just a matter of sharing information. Uh, those cameras are not doing facial recognition. Uh, but if, if you didn't know, NYPD has license plate readers like on every block in New York City. Right. That's how they, they really do well on solving crimes based on where that car was located and when it left and where it ended up. A um, lot of things that aren't necessarily seen. So about 21 years ago and 25 pounds ago, I was a, a, a sentinel at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. I was a guard at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. What you see when you're out there, there's one guard. He's doing 21 steps back and forth, you know, doing his deal. There's one guy. Um, but no one is going to cross that little fenced area to go to do any damage to that tomb. And it's just a matter of perception. You know, I don't know what's going to happen to me. You don't know that there's 12 guys downstairs that are going to come and beat you down if you try to go and, and touch the tomb. But it's all perception on what you, you see. And then what you don't see are the, the squad of infantry guys that are downstairs ready to respond if you decide you wanted to go spray paint the, the tomb. So a lot of things that aren't seen that are, that are done, but, but the things that are seen are typical, your barriers and bollards and, mm -hmm. and things like that. You heard it here first. If you're going to do a crime in New York City, do it on bike or transit or walking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that, that's an instance. Uh, London initiated that system for the city, kind of that inner financial core, that inner ring, and it was about congestion pricing mm -hmm. on the surface. Mm -hmm. But what it really was about, because, uh, because they've been ahead of us because of all the, the issues with the IRA and other, they've been ahead in terms of security. It was really about monitoring the vehicles that mm -hmm. were coming in and out mm -hmm. of the city, that inner core. Um, so it had a dual purpose. And so, but that's an example of something that cut down on pollution, congestion, mm -hmm. all of those yeah. things, that congestion pricing, but also allowed them to monitor the license plates and who was coming in and out. Rome did that as well yeah. uh, quite a few years ago. Yeah. One note, I think this is a little relevant, um, as a faculty member at Harvard, I'm part of a network, a warning network, and um, two incidents. Mm -hmm. uh, Last Friday, or last Wednesday, uh, there was a fatal accident in Harvard Square at 6.35 a.m. And within minutes, I was notified to not go to the area. The second one happened today on my way uh, from the airport to my hotel. I got a warning that said, Harvard's blue light system is out. Please be aware. And three minutes later, another thing that said, it's back on, you're good. So there is mm. this another kind of invisible uh, thing going on there, but it's a community of 20,000 people mm -hmm. who are getting those messages. Mm -hmm. MIT has the same system, yeah. MIT alert, you know, and uh, you get the text immediately. It's usually something like a canister of nitrogen in one of the labs, you know, fell mm -hmm. over or something, but certainly after the marathon bombing, Right. And all of that happening on campus, those texts were coming every five seconds right? about shelter in place and, and those things. Yeah. You've got a number of good questions for the audience about timing. And we've discussed that somewhat. You showed in the Alamo example times of day or different configurations for, to allow for a major event that's a temporal moment. Um, a couple of good questions about how do we think about interim uses and temporary uses in space. But then I think there's also a really deep one here about um, you know, the length of time that it takes to evaluate success in the built environment is long, right? We don't know whether something's a success right after it's completed and opened. Um, we evaluate, you know, the AIA gives a 25-year award. 
And in fact, you know, we haven't had this heightened level of security since, but, but we didn't have it before the Oklahoma City bombings. But we all know that many public spaces, the one upstairs, were designed and built long before that. So when we're designing, how do we think of that longer term and make it adaptable and flexible for security needs that will come up in the future that we don't even know about today? Think about that, that the dimension of time and temporality. You've asked a really hard question because we were talking about this before the, the event started. How do you know if your security intervention, interventions worked? I mean, I showed the Time magazine of you know mass shootings, 253 cities, and that is not something to take lightly. But if you look at the scale of all of our cities and towns, um, if an event didn't happen somewhere, you can't say it's because of your <coughs> interventions or your security. And so it's very hard to know what has been successful and what hasn't, I think. I don't know, you might have a different uh, I, answer. I, so we, you know, everybody asks for more money. Right. Um, and what I get from, from our supervisors, our managers is, we haven't had a, a major incident at a federal building in years. Why, why do we need to invest in that? Right. Um, because it's hard to show a success. I mean, we've, we've, we, we've we threw a billion dollars worth of contract security guards at federal buildings, and they stopped Mr. Clyde from entering the, the courthouse with a, a machine gun. So that's successful, um, but that's one instance. So you know, every, the, the, the bean counters, how do you show success that nothing's happened at my building, so give me more money because I want to make sure nothing happens at my building? They don't really go along with that. They're like, we're going to slow you down a little bit and not give you as much as you got last year. Well, a landscape architect always has to think about adaptation, right? Yeah. I mean, we never are finished, and we really are, when we build a landscape, we've always started with a landscape. We never have a blank. And also, we're just getting it going in another phase of life. Right. Um, we work with living material, and so I it might seem a little overly optimistic, but I, I think in the same way, we... We, we have to be predictive, and we also have to look back, uh, and we have to have a long span of time uh, in which we can uh, back forwards and backwards. So we think adaptively about mm. success. Mm -hmm. And I think that would go along with changes that we, we just we can't predict what our security environment is going to need to be like. We, before the... Um, Marathon bombing in Boston, the world was one way, and after that event, the world changed. Right. We just have to yeah. see ad adaptability as something um, we embrace. Mm -hmm. There's a good question in here about how do we differ in our discussions and responses to this issue from other countries, especially other democracies. Um, how, how, how much to one extreme are we, or are there solutions from other places that we could learn from? I, I, in my research, the, uh, certainly right after 9-11, maybe for the decade after, uh, the U.S. security, um, talking to Boston Security, New York, Counterterrorism Division of the NYPD, they were looking to Great Britain, um, and they were looking to Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, were two of the kind of examples because they had been uh, thinking in very sophisticated ways about security and, and also invisible mm. security within their societies for a long time. So there were a lot of trips over, kind of back and forth, I don't know. Yeah, um, two weeks ago, the State Department sponsored it. It's called the Four Century Forum. It's done every year. Um, 10 or 12 different countries participate. Um, Spend some time with the with the team. Um, the UK is much more advanced than than we are. Um, I wasn't going to say that. I'm glad you did. I, I, it's, I, I, I was. I was. So this group called uh, CPNI, Center for the Protection of Critical Infrastructure. Um, so t today, I got several emails from from security vendors on. I got the best camera in the world. I got the best vehicle <laughs> barrier. The best whatever. And I don't know how to judge that. The, the UK, the CPNI, evaluate, so they'll, they'll put out a request to security vendors, we need the best door in the world to prevent someone from entering a facility. <clears throat> Send us your door. And, and we need it to meet these specs. And then they test it. And if it meets the specs, then that, that door manufacturer, that door model number gets put on a preferred 
security equipment list that shopping malls, office buildings, uh, they want to buy off that list. They don't have to deal with the vendor telling you I got the best door in the world because these guys, have, I mean, they cut the door, they time it, they have a, a novice try to get in the door, they have a mid-level thief try to get in the door, then they have like a Delta Force guy try to get in the door. And they <laughs> time that and they average it and does it meet the requirement that they put out. Um, it's phenomenal. So they, uh, they do it with glass and, and vehicle barriers and cameras and, I mean, you name it. We don't do that. Um, we put out a bid. We normally do it through Fed Biz Ops. Hey, we need cameras uh, for a federal <laughs> building. We get all kinds of crazy nonsense that, you know, is, is and normally the, the circuit boards are made in China. So, you know, <laughs> learning from the UK is phenomenal. What was interesting to see is, is the other countries were now leveraging the UK. Mm -hmm. So if the UK, hey, can I get that list of preferred providers? Um, uh, New Zealand. Uh, Australia. These guys are leveraging what the UK has done um, because why reinvent the wheel? Right. Um, so I was in Mexico um, last month to meet with the, the new chief of the Mexican federal police. You know, there's a lot of issues in Mexico. Um, but the first thing that I found interesting was going through Mex Mexican customs. Anybody have been to Mexico? I mean, it, they just kind of waved me through. Um, and then the the it was uh, your uniform. You know? No, no, I was <laughs> I was in the you know khakis and the polo. Um, but then the next thing was the uh, DHS attaché to the embassy who was picking me up. Um, he's there. He says, "Oh, come on! I got it parked out here." And we go, and I, I go to open the door. I'm like, "Damn, this door is heavy." And I open the door, and it's uh, it's armored. The vehicle is armored. I'm like, "What? Why are we in an armored vehicle?" He says, "Dude, this is Mexico City. Just go with it." Um, <laughs> So, you know, there's, there's, I mean, it's nothing but crime. Don't go, to, don't go down that block because the, you'll get killed. Don't go there. Don't leave your hotel. I mean, I was like shocked about, don't do all this stuff. I mean, I was in Paris for a conference a couple of years ago and it's just, you know, it's Paris. It's fun. Right. Same with London and the whole works. So, right. so every, every, every country is different. Mexico is well below um, the standards that we have in place for security at our, our facilities. But what I thought was interesting is the new commissioner of the Mexican National Police says, I want to learn from you guys how you protect your, because he's now responsible for the federal uh, facilities in Mexico, and he's going to come here to see how we do it and compare notes, and, and hopefully we can help each other with learning best practices. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's worth thinking about flipping the coin around a little bit. Um, what is the perception that we put across to mm -hmm. visitors here? A little story, one of my several engagements with the really good people at NCPC was that we were invited about six years ago, I think now, to produce some design ideas for how you would um, rethink the White House South Lawn security, the President's Park South. And uh, this was um, reservation number one, right, designated by our first president as sacred ground that we all own. And uh, so in the kind of the run up to the presentations across the street um, and during the design work that preceded that, we were um, puzzled by a few things. One of which was why do we provide free parking for federal employees on the ellipse when there are 8,000 parking spaces in garage within the same walking distance. This is not, I don't want to make this a political thing, but the night before, um, the night before we made the presentations, my colleagues and I from our team decided just to walk through, you know, you sort of want to make sure you kind of like got your marbles in order, like yeah. let's go look at this one more time and make the best presentation we can. And uh, I had thought about the the view of the White House from the south, from the ellipse. As you know, growing up as a kid watching um, network news, night, nightly news, if there was an event, if there was a major event in the world, that might have been very often the first image you would see on TV at seven o'clock, right? That image of which, which really was, in a way, the image 
the iconic image of the free world and you know a, an important bully pulpit or let's say an, an important place of pronouncement, right? And so walking over there, you know, past the sally ports and all that, I could hear in other languages how disappointing it was that they couldn't really see it. It struck me. And I went there today, just before coming here, and there was, for some reason, I don't know who's arriving back here, um, there was increased standoff distance, and people were being shooed away. Like hundreds of tourists were shooed away from that scene, which they still believe, they still want to believe, is a, a symbol of freedom in the world. Mm -hmm. And that's hard. So we, mm -hmm. we you know, it's important to we project as well. It's important to protect yeah. the first family and you know the yeah. Senate office building and uh, but. And I, I mean, sorry, the, the executive office building, that's important, but boy, it does have um, price to pay. We're giving something up, yeah. Great point. Uh, uh, it made me think of sitting down with the counterterrorism chief at NYPD a number of years ago, and he talked about they do counterterrorism drills at random in Midtown Manhattan, you know, around Bryant Park, what a wonderful public space that is. And, and just everyone's out, the SWAT teams, counterterrorism for us, and they'll run it for like five minutes and then be done. And it's a, they view it as a deterrent. Yeah. And um, we had a, a long discussion because in talking to security people in other countries, particularly in Israel, there's this notion of if you harden one target, you're just shifting the, the terrorism to somewhere else. And that's basically what the building owners in the financial district of Boston know. They know we're going to harden our target. They're going to go somewhere else. So if you're looking at this from a larger perspective about our society, that approach doesn't work. And this notion of getting everyone out there in these SWAT teams and counterterrorism forces, OK, so they're going to move to JFK Airport or you know, hit our George Washington Bridge, or, or what is that? So, and, and then all of those tourists, right? Mm. Uh, even from New Jersey. <laughs> but what, what, um, what, what are they thinking? Yeah. You know? Yeah. So. Well, let's ask you a question about um, working with lots of competing jurisdictions, or, or overlapping jurisdictions, right? In DC, I think we take that to cuckoo mm. proportions. <laughs> Um, with you know federal and local agencies, when you when you're talking about planning events or policing events, right? There's local police force, the architect of the, of the capital, the parks police, um, but also a lot of actors that are like the business improvement districts that are doing a lot of programming in public space, universities. So how do you do deal with logistical things like who pays for street closures and extra security hours, whether it's a, a an event of national significance or local significance or a private or exclusive event, and then also what insights can you glean from any experiences working with all those complicated overlapping jurisdictions? What's that question for? <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, uh, you. <laughs> you know, it's been, I think it's piecemeal. I think yeah. there is no answer. I mean, that's part of the issue is that there's, uh, it's kind of trial by error. There is no oversight. You know, in Boston, it's shifting a bit, but it really was kind of taken over by the private sector, mm -hmm. a lot of the interventions, and, and it just happened. And I think when you look at things like bids and, and what they're doing, I think it's on a case-by-case -case basis. You know, what kind of relationship do you have with the city? What are they willing to put in in terms of public safety? And, and what does that look like? Who's running the events? And everything is a bit, that's why I feel like there needs to be some kind of kit, like the questions you might ask or the considerations you might have. You know, there's so, we plan in so many places and there are so few resources to go around. And so any time that you can make it last longer or look at best practices and not have to reinvent the wheel because you're looking at the UK or somewhere else, it's better for everybody. And that, that really isn't happening. I think it's not happening for a couple of reasons. One, I think 
there is trial and error going on, um, particularly at the local level when you're not talking about GSA or the federal, but how do you even begin to think about a threat assessment? Who should you call? What security experts might you trust? But there's also, I think, this notion, and I don't know if this is just my particular view on this, that sharing security information is bad. Because if it gets out in the public mm. realm, somehow you're going to compromise you know, what, what measures you've taken. And I'm not sure that's really true, that you're compromising. You know, if people know there are bollards up or a protected bike lane, like what's going to happen with that? I don't know. But so this notion of sharing doesn't really happen in an open way in the way that it might benefit everybody. Because not everybody has a security expertise that you and your department have, right? So where do you go? And it costs money. Yeah, um, so a couple of th so Jim Craddy over here used to uh, work with FPS and then he he lost his mind and went somewhere else. Uh, but he is actually with the um, with in, in cyber security infrastructure security agency CISA within DHS and the um, infrastructure security division uh, protective security advisors. So these are the guys that are so I can't I, I I could go out and and help a shopping mall with developing a security plan or security. But you know my focus is on federal. But so Jim and his team, they do this at, at religious institutions, shopping malls, hotels, whatever it may be. And he's going to talk to you guys about what they do tomorrow. So I think that's a, that's a one place that that can really work well with city county jurisdictions. Um, for law enforcement wise, here in D.C., if you go Pennsylvania Avenue, the jurisdiction of the street is the Metropolitan Police Department. The sidewalk on either side is the U.S. Park Police. And the federal facilities are, are ours. So, you know, if we don't work together to figure that out, yeah. then it's quite a mess. I mean, we've had, had a, 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 a person uh, call 911 for an active shooter at one of our facilities on Pennsylvania Avenue. And it was, I mean, there was 100 police cars there in like a minute. It was a door slammed shut. And, you know, she thought she, you know, people are kind of wigged out right now about active shooters. But it turned out to be nothing. But anyway, the response was incredible. Um, in, in other locations, um, not so much. So if we, some demonstrations that we've dealt with recently um, are immigration related. Uh, people that may not be happy with uh, the administration's apport, um, approach to immigration and they demonstrate. Um, and then a new term for us that we've learned over the last couple of years is sanctuary cities. Uh, sanctuary counties is the next step and then sanctuary states. So if we have an immigration-related demonstration at a federal building in a sanctuary city, the local law enforcement provide minimal support, if any. Not that they don't want to. I mean, cops are going to help, help cops out, but they're bound by their uh, city administrator, their city council, their mayor, the governor, whoever it may be, and what they can and can't do. So we try to turn that a little bit. This is not an immigration issue, this is a public safety issue, they're blocking your street, you know, you got to help us on this thing. And it's all in the way that you approach it because it, it's, it's, it's a little messy uh, when you get out, primarily when you get out towards the West Coast. But if it's a, an active shooter at a federal building, you're going to get everybody and anybody to respond there. Um, we do share best practices on security with our city, county, state, and federal partners. We do a better job of it. Everyone's so busy, it's hard to get a meeting together with the chief of MPD and park and all the different jurisdictions to sit down and talk about this. But um, mutual aid is big here in DC. Uh, if someone comes and helps me at a federal building over an emergency issue, uh, they're not gonna ask me for money. And same in return, you know, we had the demonstrators yesterday morning that had chained themselves to the, mm. their boats. Um, uh, we have what's considered a cut team, a team that's trained to cut um, instruments off individuals without hurting them to get them out of the street and off that. So we, we're not going to charge MPD with that because tomorrow they're going to come and help me for an issue I have at my federal building. So mutual aid is really big here um, throughout the national capital region. Um, but if, if we were asked, so the Reagan building, might have been the Reagan building, it's a beautiful building, first building I ever worked in as an FPS employee. They have a lot of events. Um, if there's going to be an event in one of the auditoriums, a um, thousand people are coming. It's tonight from six to ten. We're going to task uh, the Trade Center Management Associates, the people that run that part of the Reagan Building. All right, you're going to have to have more guards on duty to screen these people. You're going to have to have some of our law enforcement. You're going to have to pay this much. 
to be able to be able to have that event because we got to secure the the event itself. So and then so there's a cost to some of this. Yeah. I think we heard from each of you a little bit about the potential for win-win solutions, innovations that do both, that both make us more secure and make our spaces better, more active, more actively used, more open, create more civic engagement. What are your best examples of that kind of a win-win thing that you've seen in the world? What, what gives you most promise? What are the examples? I, th I think any time things are more walkable, you're yep. restricting vehicular access, your yep. complete streets and enhancing the public realm in that way, making yep. it better for bicycles, protected bicycle lanes that do double duty to protecting sidewalks and buildings that are right at the street edge. Um, those, are, those are experienced by a lot mm -hmm. of people mm -hmm. in different ways. Mm -hmm. uh, different modes of transportation, and maybe the drivers aren't so happy. But in the end, everyone benefits uh, mm -hmm. environmentally. You know, um, as an advocate for the walkable city, I would say that. So I, I think that there are ways to think about those kinds of interventions that do double duty and really are invisible in terms of what their purpose could be, a second mm -hmm. purpose. Well, I really like this answer. And I would just add that. Um, uh, we are in a time when um, urbanists are really rethinking and reprioritizing the street. Mm -hmm. Our street is a contested space now. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I think it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's yes. thanks to bicyclists and complete streets advocates and a whole lot of other people in the, in the design fields, I would say, too. Yeah. Um, who have, and, and also, you, yeah, I have to add rideshare and technology. All these things have conspired to get us to a place where we no longer need to think that the paving is owned by one set of forces and then the curb and the sidewalk another, and that we can mix those. We can right. reorganize the right. proportions of them, yep. and we can even manage traffic. So, we could maybe we could say that we'll never think of the city street again as a single-purpose right. asset. Mm -hmm. That that mm -hmm. and this in this way would answer Susan's um, imploring us to um, make sure that you know security design is always going to produce a public benefit. I mean, the street makes up the largest proportion of public space yeah. in any yes. community. Every city. Yeah. So thinking about it in that way it is our public how realm. those improvements. 25% of every city is a street. And so uh, anything that can make that a better experience for everyone and address some of the security issues is a win-win all around. Yep. That's great. I, I think the work that's being done to develop this standoff distance in, in uh, Cambridge and in Miami uh, is it's tough because you know I mean look in D.C. where the federal facilities are they're they're right they're they're, they're ten the feet away from the street, um, but it really improves security and it really does allow us to kind of bring it down a little bit. We I don't know if anyone here has TSA PreCheck if you've enrolled in that program. We have a, at, our, at our courthouses that we protect. We have a lot of of attorneys that are there every day, and they're they're taking their belts their belt off their shoes and and. You know, it's getting a little crazy because our, our security officers are like, hey, Jim, how you doing? How's the family? You know, they know these guys because they see them every day. So, we're, you know, how can we develop something similar to a TSA pre-check for those people that are in and out of these facilities every day? Um, and we're learning that from TSA on how that system works. Um, and then awareness is big. So, so everyone, every, every citizen of the United States needs to be aware that something could happen. Um, and how do, how do they react to it? And not, I saw a video of, uh, you saw the, the um, vehicle as a weapon in Nice a couple years ago. And it's a video of, you know, someone's taking a, there's a band playing and there's people dancing and having a great time and everybody's having fun. And then the, the camera kind of pans over here and it, it shows a, a, probably a 19 year old guy. And he's got his camera up and he's aiming it at this guy. And in the background, that truck is plowing over people and no one knows about it. I mean, there's no, it's coming to hit this guy in the back and he's like this looking and, and there's people, it, there's no awareness of it. Mm -hmm. um, 
So we need to make sure that our planners for events like Chili Cook-Off down on Pennsylvania Avenue, that they plan for that. I mean, you're going to have to put up vehicle barriers. You're going to have to be aware of, of people that are entering the area. They're coming in with a machine gun or whatnot. Um, but also the, the, the instant messaging to let people know this is going on right now and you've got to be aware of it. Yeah. And not for us to continue to live in a shell thinking it won't happen here yep. because, you know, there was no screening coming in here today. Yep. And we could watch someone come in here and, and start going a little bit crazy on us. Right. Um, and we've got to be aware of that. You know? And we can't just become a victim. I'm just going to sit here and let that person kill me. We've all got instant, let's throw stuff at them. Let's throw your laptop, your tablet, whatever you may. Let's fight for our, ourselves and not just be a, um, a victim. And, and we all need to be aware of that. I mean, in Israel, everyone's acutely aware uh, yeah. that they're targets. Yeah. Um, and they, they, they act accordingly. Yeah. Uh, they pay attention. They report things. And, and so we don't need to lock places down. We just need to make sure that we're all taking care of each other. And, and if we see something that looks out of place, we're telling someone about it. And, and then someone is reacting to that and not just, yeah, we'll take care of that later. The last question is a great one. It's not really a question, I want to warn you. It's, it's an anecdote, um, but so I'm, just, I'm just asking if you have a response to it. Um, but it's a great anecdote that I've never heard. A apparently, after, in a, 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 an event, a program that happened post 9-11, I think shortly after 9-11 from the way the question is phrased, and by, clearly written by someone who went to some kind of design school by the handwriting. So, <laughs> excellent font here. Um, <laughs> But uh, apparently, Samuel, De Samuel Daniel, Pat Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who uh, was a driving force behind the redesign of Pennsylvania Avenue that we see out front, um, was asked at this post 9 11 event, what should we do to redesign our cities and our buildings to make them more safe? And he leaned forward and said, nothing. And they said, nothing? And he said, nothing. What would you respond? I like him. Yeah. I like him. Big fan. Who doesn't, right? Uh, uh, world has changed. What did, yes. Yeah. The world has changed, I think. Well, I guess the question is, do we have to design our, redesign our buildings and public spaces, or do we think about how we live in society and what our policies are, our public policies? Mm -hmm. Would be a, maybe mm -hmm. a controversial, mm -hmm. you know, counter question. Mm -hmm. You know, Good. why are we spending billions of dollars to protect against someone with an assault weapon. Right. You know, why are we doing that? And um, I'm going to leave it at there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm a federal employee, so I'm not going to touch that one. <laughs> 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 Mama ne needs a new car, and, you know, I don't want to mess around with that. So, so, you know, people get fired in a minute on a, on a, a tweet, so i got to be careful. Um, but I grew up on Greasy Creek Road in Brown County, Indiana. Um, and it, people in Brown County uh, really don't care about the public policy. Or what they, these people have known each other for a thousand years, mm -hmm. and they take care of each other. And if someone shows up in that county that's not from that county, mm -hmm. then they're, hey, who's that guy? What's mm -hmm. he doing here? Mm -hmm. um, so it's a, it, you know, it's a different environment uh, throughout the country. Ames, Iowa is a place I always talk about because we, we have a lot of federal community in Ames, Iowa, which is kind of weird. Um, but nothing happens there. You know, we don't have a lot of crime there. We don't have a lot of issues there. It's, it's rural America. They take care of each other. And it's completely different than what we deal with here and in Boston and New York and Chicago, Atlanta. I mean, we can go on. Um, it's just it's the, the way people perceive you know, how things are. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> my reaction is that I grew up in New York State, north of New York City, and Daniel Patrick Moynihan was a hero for me. Mm -hmm. um, I think he was a humanist. That's what mm -hmm. you're hearing in mm -hmm. his thing. He was mm -hmm. a humanist. He yeah. believed that people would take care of it. Right. And we just need more people like that. Right. That's great. On that, let's thank our panelists. For <laughs>